This is the second uh, installment on our series on cults and religions, and it's my privilege of teaching you about the uh, LDS uh, Church, or the Mormons, maybe well, better known as, but the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And today it is my objective that we will come away learning about the history, the practices, and doctrinal beliefs of the Mormon Church. I want you to be impressed by God's character, plan of salvation, and the purity of his word, and also be able to effectively share the gospel with Mormons. And you know, as I was singing with you before, um, all praise, honor, and glory belongs to God. And we have such an amazing Savior. I just really hope that you come away with being impressed with who he is and what he's done, even in light of the contrast between uh, how the Mormons or the LDS Church sees him. And so I really hope that that is the case. One of the most insidious things about the church, actually, is that they hide behind these wildly different definitions of terms, pretending to be orthodox when, in fact, their doctrine is very unorthodox and even deceptive. So misunderstanding words, that is too good a place to uh, uh, use as an introduction. So let's consider, before we dig into sort of this dark topic, let's look at some of the humorous things that can happen as we misunderstand language, like these two guys here. You rock. No, you rule. Here's some uh, interesting, uh, what would they be called? Uh, homophones? Is that right, Kristen? Homophones? Homophones. Sorry, homophones. There's no reference, by the way, this next one, no reference to my wife, but... How would you read this? It's very important, isn't it? Is this, my wife is a world famous sewer? I won't even say the other one. <laughs> I tore into the subject, and after a couple, a couple hours, I really slayed it. Subject, person, or topic? This one. I told my buddy I had some things to intimate or intimate to him. And then he punched me in the face. <laughs> My wife and her girlfriends went on a fishing trip, but I'm a little worried. She can't, wait to, she can't wait to show me the beautiful bass or bass she brought back. Important. After the doctor introduced himself and checked me over, he, call, he got called away. And as he was leaving, he said, I'll be back in a few minutes. Why don't you pull up a stool? <laughs> well, okay, he's the doctor. Here's uh, some funny signs that I found. This is uh, in, the, um, in the, uh, um, the theme of the holidays, upcoming holidays. Here's, a, here's one. It's only $250. You get a Christmas bag of threats. <laughs> this one doesn't, uh, this might be a little closer to the truth. Just one little change of a letter completely changes from Santa this. And then this uh, shows that this is not only a problem here in the U.S., it can happen worldwide. Asia's worst, worst superhero, Toilet Man. <laughs> and last but not least, this is maybe closer to the truth. That's how I feel anyway sometimes. Please pay your parking fee before existing. <laughs> uh, classic. So as funny as these things are, you know, language is very important. And meaning is a very serious matter. What words mean? For just as Satan sought to deceive Eve by questioning and changing the meaning of words, we see a consistent onslaught of attacks on language. Why is that? It's because the basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use the words. It's very serious business. So now as a quick review, <clears throat> why we should spend time studying cults and religions. Uh, let's just look back and see, uh, briefly cover some of the things that uh, uh, Pastor Stiegel said last month. And you know, before I do, let me just say that as we get into this topic, if you're listening tonight and you're, uh, you belong to LDS Church or that if you listen to this after the fact, you know, my, my goal is really not to tear you down or to say anything disparaging about something that you hold to be, uh, to, to hold to be true, but we want to get to what the truth really is. And we have 
a loving Savior that wants to save you by his grace, apart from anything that you could do. And so I hope that that's what uh, we come away with tonight. But remember, we would probably, uh, oh, sorry, we should, uh, we should learn about religions and cults because we don't want to be deceived ourselves. We need to grow in grace and the knowledge of his word, right? And so that we're ready in our evangelism as well. And again, think back to his message. And what is the definition of religion? Because we would probably say religion is man-made. It's uh, very uh, focused on what you do, right? It's legalistic. But Webster defines, defines religion as a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Number two, it could be the service and worship of God or the supernatural commitment or devotion to religious faith or observance or even a cause, a principle, or a system of beliefs held to with ardor or faith. I mean, according to that definition, we, Duluth Bible Church would fit that, wouldn't we? So what is the difference then between a religion and a cult? Well, a cult is a religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious. And spurious is uh, illegitimate or fake. Unorthodox. It involves great devotion to a person, an idea, an object, a movement, or a work, such as a film or a book. And then it's a system of religious beliefs and ritual. Again, what is the difference between a religion and a cult, then? It seems strangely close, doesn't it? And really, the only difference here is being unorthodox and spurious, and maybe the, the, uh, the great devotion, devotion here with cults and more of a, a nominal devotion to, uh, uh, to religion. We could even be considered as a cult, I suppose, if it's just about the degree to which you are committed to something. I mean, you're here on a Wednesday night. That's pretty, pretty uh, extreme, isn't it? To a lot of people in the world, they would say that it is. But the unorthodox is so important. You know, some people would say that we're unorthodox. Now, we would hold that you know, we have tried to hold close to the literal, grammatical, historical, normal interpretation of the Word of God, and many other so-called Christian churches have wandered from that. But we need more to this definition of cult. So let's, I would like to suggest the following, that some other important qualities of cults are that they involve blindly following people, unquestionably, unquestionably following a leader. It also involves leaders exercising great control over a devotee's personal life. They have hidden or secretive practices, often, and they depart from God's revealed written truth and regard their leader's words as authoritative or even equal to the author authority of Scripture. I would like to submit that uh, we add that to Webster's um, definition. because we need to define our terms clearly. So where do cults and unbiblical religions actually come from? Come from? Let's remember that ultimately, at the end of the day, it's Satan working through people, right? It's Satan working through people. The commandments and doctrines of men, and they come from demons working through idols and men. And let's also keep in mind how God wants us to respond. Because all of this is not just for knowledge's sake, but how, how we can respond to these folks. How does he want us to respond? He wants us to be ready as ambassadors for Christ. And also, that we should be test the spirits and their teachings to compare them with Scripture. How do we know whether this is true or not? Some of us have a familiarity with Mormonism. Some people have a lot of experience with, experiences with uh, Mormons. But um, I think hopefully this will be helpful for you tonight. So in obedience to that last command, let's get into their teachings and compare them with Scripture to see which things are so and whether we should have any fellowship at all with them. So first of all, for your definition, there's only one word that you have to fill in, and here it is. Mormonism derives its doctrine from four holy books and the words of modern-day prophets redefines Christian terms and teaches that all people are spirit children of Heavenly Father and Mother and can go to the celestial heaven and one day become gods through belief in Jesus Christ, membership in the Mormon church, observance of ordinances, and holy living. 
That's a mouthful, isn't it? And I think I only have one thing that you have to fill in there is the four, is that right? But you know why the other things are underlined? Because I want you to see from the onset, right from the get-go, that it is faith in Christ plus membership, plus observance of ordinances, plus holy living. And right there you should know, right out of the, out of the gates, there's something wrong with this. Because it's only about Jesus Christ, right? So this has been a slog studying this. It's, it's been kind of interesting. But it is uh, a man-made system of deception and bizarre stories. If this was a novel, I think it would actually be pretty entertaining. Uh, not especially written well, but entertaining. Uh, but since it's a religion that's deceiving millions of people, uh, you know, we must understand and not accept it. So let's spend some time in the development in history of the Mormon church. Where does this thing come from? Okay, so buckle up. This is where it starts to get a little weird. <laughs> so, oh, and by the way, pardon if I, if I use too much sarcasm. I will try not to, but sometimes it's just so tempting because <laughs> this stuff is so, so out there. Uh, but we know that the original architects of Mormonism were Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. So Joseph Smith Jr. grew up during a time of uh, religious upheaval and change. It was the, known as the Second Great Awakening around the early 1800s and then up and through the time he was uh, a young man. And according to written statements of those close to the family, uh, Smith was uh, extreme, the, the Smith family were extremely superstitious and though they eventually converted to the Presbyterian Church, they continued to engage in some very strange things. Uh, of particular note, Joseph Smith Sr. was convinced that he knew the whereabouts of Captain Kidd's buried treasure, or generally the, the location of it. And he made many digs, not just a few, many, like more than 10, with Joseph Jr. and his brother, guided by a peep stone, his term, not mine, but guided by a peep stone that would reveal the next location in which to dig. Though they never found the treasure, Joseph uh, Sr. did find another way to make money using peep stones because he used them to sell and tell fortunes. Eventually, Smith, uh, Smith's father uh, ran into trouble with the law when he and another guy got into a counterfeiting uh, scheme and he, sterned, he did turn state's evidence, so he was never prosecuted, but his friend was and went to prison. Now, Joseph Jr. grew up in this family, and he was known uh, by friends and neighbors for his convincing yet very dishonest storytelling as a kid. Then in 1820, at age 15, something changed all that, I guess. Something miraculous happened. In 1820, that would have put him at age 15, Smith, according to his own words, was disenchanted with the Christian churches around him during his teenage years. Now, can you believe that? A teenager disenchanted with the church and claimed to have prayed earnestly to God for direction on this uh, conflict that he was having. His prayers were answered. When two personages, understood to be God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to him at his bedside. They told Joseph that the Christian churches of his day, all of them were corrupt, and they were not very happy with them either, and that he should wait for them to reveal the true Christian church, the true and only Christian church, and they also revealed that Smith was going to be their chosen prophet to the world. Something at 15. It's odd, though, that the Father, God the Father, would choose to take on physical form this once in human history, contradicting his word that says that he's a spirit and no man can look upon God and live, right? So, three years pass, and that must have felt very long and disappointing for the prophet Smith because he went back to digging for treasure with his dad during those three years. But then, another visit. This time, it was, and apparently uh, I have misspelled uh, Moroni, I think I have M-A on some of my slides here. It should be M-O-R-O-N. 
So uh, Moroni was the glorified son of Mormon. Mormon was his father in heaven. And Moroni visited Joseph and told him of the location of two books containing, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, two books made up of golden tablets with writings from the last of the Nephite people who were actually Jews who had come to North America in six, uh, about 600 uh, uh, AD, or no, I'm sorry, 600 BC, and who Jesus Christ appeared to after he was resurrected. Did you catch all that? That's something. I mean, that's a, a tall tale and a half. Now, when Christ was resurrected, he appeared to the Nephite people and gave them the true gospel. So, for your handout, he claimed a visit from God at 15, then three years later, the angel Moroni, Smith began translating, visit after the people were res res uh, visited by the resurrected Christ. Christ. So, This time, like I said, Moroni, the glorified son of Mormon who visited Joseph, told him the location of these golden tablets. And uh, it was on this hill named Camorra near Palmyra, New York. And that is an actual place, Camorra near Palmyra, New York. And so uh, Joseph went there, no doubt aided by his uh, digging experience, and found this stone box containing these golden tablets that Moroni told him about. He was able to open the, cave, the, the stone box, but he was not able to bring the tablets uh, home with him because whenever he tried, he would either be thrown to the ground or he would dig, get the, the tablets out, and then as soon as he turned his back to set them down, they would miraculously go back into the stone box. And Moroni told him that the reason for that was that his, he was not pure of heart, and his, his motives were that he was tainted with greed. So after four years, he went back one, every year and tried over and over. On the fourth year, he was able to bring them home. Now, according to Mormon sources, these books measured about six inches by six inches by eight inches, which would put them somewhere around 140 to 200 pounds. It's pretty heavy to be hauling around by yourself, I'm just saying. Um, Moroni, the, oh, another thing is, they were written in revised Egyptian. Revised Egyptian. Egyptian. Now, Moroni must have known that that was going to be a problem because he left Smith with the Urim and the Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim were special glasses that were made to help him translate the reformed Egyptian. And only he could wear them, and only he could read it. So after finding some dedicated, dedicated followers who would serve as scribes, Joseph dictated the translation of the context, context, uh, contents of these tablets. Uh, and though the tablets were actually never present during the transcription process, now interestingly, Smith himself said that he was greatly aided by the Old King James Bible, which is why there is some biblical references in there, although the translations are strange. So Smith, just one more thing like this. Smith reported after a year of working on these translations, the fervor and excitement of him and his friend that he had found became so intense that on May 15th, 1828, Peter, James, and John dispatched John the Baptist to visit him and baptize him into the Aaronic priesthood. So he's got that going for him, which is good. So that's, that's kind of the, that's how uh, the Book of Mormon came to be, because in 1830, after three years of translation and transcription, using the Urim and the Thummim, the Book of Mormon was published. And shortly after, with a small number of followers, I think it was either six or seven, the Church of Christ was established, later renamed to the Church of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the LDS. Now, I'm not going to go into the troubles and the conflicts that this new church had with almost every 
uh, local group that they interacted with, but suffice it to say, they had to move a lot. Um, eventually, they ended up in Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, they bought some land and were able to, um, to incorporate. And so as an incorporated city, I guess, they could form a, um, a militia. And they had somewhere between two and 3,000 uh, members of this militia, which was kind of intimidating to the state of Illinois and to the locals around there because I don't even think the, the uh, federal government had an army that large at that time. So they had a lot of conflict with people around them. They moved a lot. They ended up in uh, Nauvoo, Illinois. And during this time, they embraced the practice, the doctrine of polygamy, which you've heard a lot about. And that's probably one of the main things that you think of when you think of Mormonism. Um, it's certainly one of them. So we're going to talk a little bit more later about polygamy. But this is what, um, after Joseph Smith died and Brigham Young took over, this is, these are the words of, of Brigham Young. Again, also a or God-ordained prophet of Mormonism. If any man espouse a virgin and desire to, uh, desire to espouse another, and the first give her consent, and if he espouse the second and they are virgins, and have vowed to no other man, then he is justified. He cannot commit adul adultery, for they are given unto him. For he cannot commit adultery with that that belongeth unto him and to no one else. So as long as it was monogamous, between him and the new wife, I guess, it would be okay because it would not be uh, uh, adultery, is what he said. So emboldened by people's willingness, it's interesting, though, because really um, uh, Joseph Smith's polygamy was part of his downfall because he was emboldened by people's willingness to go along with, with this doctrine. Sorry, I need to go back. Uh, but one of his... One of his um, his assistant, John C. Bennett, refused to uh, give his wife to Joseph Smith. They, he was going around asking for other people's wives and saying, you know, she's supposed to be mine. And the guy said, take a hike, you're crazy. He actually took a hike and he started something called the Nauvoo Expositor. And the Nauvoo Expositor was a, uh, a, a local publication that basically talked about the polygamous practices and the doctrines of the Mormon church put it out to the wider community. Not popular with the people of around Nauvoo. So uh, Smith could not tolerate this public criticism and embarrassment, so in 1844 he ordered that the printing press that the Nauvoo uh, expositor was, was printed on be destroyed. Well, the state of Illinois finally got involved because this was a matter of uh, a freedom of press and freedom of speech. And they arrested uh, Joseph Smith and his brother and Smith was imprisoned, during which time a mob of 200 locals stormed the jail and shot Smith to death. End of the Smith story. Beginning of the Brigham Young story. Oh, incidentally, Smith went down fighting. He killed two people on his way out, so he really couldn't say that he was a martyr, right? So, now enter Brigham Young. Brigham Young took over as prophet and leader. He was the one that moved the church to Utah and presided over for over three decades. This was an impressive guy in some ways. He was a, a pretty gifted orator. He was very determined, uh, very courageous, and uh, brave. You know, he, he uh, again, decided to move the whole church to uh, the Great Salt Lake in Utah. So, like Smith, Young was involved in immorality and, and polygamy. Unlike his predecessor, he was bloodthirsty and cruel. Uh, one thing that he was well known for is that he ordered the uh, murder of over 100 non-Mormon immigrants in his attempt at controlling the territory of Utah. Um, I say territory because he went there when it was still technically belonging to, um, it was a, a, a part of the Mexican um, uh, Mexican controlled and owned land. But in 1850, it actually uh, became one of the territories of the U.S. So he thought he could get away from the watchful eye of the federal government, but he couldn't. So he dies in 1877, 
and another prophet takes over, and another after that, and another after that. It's revealing that when in 1890, that's 13 years after Young's death, President Wilfred Woodruff abolished polyg uh, polygamy from anywhere in the U.S., threatening to confiscate all the prophecy of the LDS church, and conveniently, the eldest LDS prophetly of that, prophet of that time also received a revelation about ending the practice of polygamy around that time. So that was convenient, really good for them, I guess. Now, there uh, some branches still practice polygamy. Uh, there's one called the FLDS, the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. And again, they would hold that going back to the earliest teachings is the best idea. Okay, quite a slog, isn't it? Yuck. So now we have a background of the development and history of the Mormon church. Now we need to be familiar with the foundation upon which the LDS doctrine is built. So essentially, what they claim as their sources of truth are, number one, the Book of Mormon, and we already talked about that. But we'll go into that a little bit more. The Doctrines and Covenants, that's another book that they sub, uh, subscribe to. The Pearl of Great Price, the Bible, and Current Living Pro Prophets. And we're not going to go really in depth with these, but um, I'll at least give you an idea of what each of them are. The first, as I told you about, was the uh, golden tablets uh, that were translated into English and put into the Book of Mormon. Again, he was greatly aided by the Bible in helping translate these tablets. Um, the next is the Doctrines and Covenants, Book of the Doctrines and Covenants. Now, this was first published in 1835 as a later version of the Book of Commandments, which was partially printed in 1833. So the, basically, they just re, uh, this book contains revelations uh, of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and other church, later church leaders. So it basically is um, uh, their church wisdom. They also ascribe to the Pearl of Great Price. Now this is a book that has five second sections of Smith's writings. The first one is, if you're interested in this, uh, the Book of Moses, which is essentially, or roughly equivalent to the first six chapters of Genesis. The Book of Abraham, which is a translation of the uh, Egyptian papyrus, which later proved to be fraudulent. And ex an extract from Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, extracts from the mystery of jo Joseph Smith's life, which is basically an autobi autobiography, autobiography, and then the Articles of Faith. So they have the Book of Mormon, Book of Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and the Bible. The problem is that the Bible has been corrupted by the Roman Catholic Church so much that you can't really trust it. The only way you can correctly interpret it is, any guesses? The other books. Right. So there's kind of an unfortunate circular reasoning going around there. The, the benefit, the positive is that they do believe that at least some of the Bible is correct and is the word of God. So we have that from which to build. And as their fifth and last foundation of faith, faith they also have modern day prophets. Again, modern day prophets' words have the, have the authority of uh, God's word and scriptures. They believe that what they say is God's word. No big surprise here, right? <laughs> All the way along, they've accepted these extra biblical sources of truth, which we know to be a sure means of disaster. Why is that? Well, <laughs> God's qualification for a prophet is uh, very particular. He says in Deuteronomy 18, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. I'm not saying we should do that today. I'm just saying in the Old Testament, this is the standard that God had for, for a prophet. And if you say in your heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? 
Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. How do we know the difference? And God says, when a, spot, a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you shall not be afraid of him. And again, he's to be put to death. So Mormons believe in modern-day prophets. Why is that a problem? Because the heart is desperately deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, right? You, we cannot trust man's heart. And thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart de departs from the Lord. And so, friend, if you're watching now or after the fact and you're part of the LDS church, this is what God says. He says, you are cursed if you trust in man. Instead, look to what his word says. Don't look to what the extra-biblical texts of Mormonism and the pearl of great price and things that basically just men made up as they thought they were, as they claimed to be led along. Go to the Bible. See what it says. So, having seen what the foundation is laid on, let's dig into some of the doctrinal beliefs, because this starts to get a little bit more encouraging as uh, we can see what they think and what the Lord actually says. Because it's built, this is a cult built on bizarre human fantasy and manipulation uh, and uh, demonic deception. So is it another branch of Christianity? Well, how do we know? It sure has some strange foundations, but what do they actually believe? Let's look at that. Because they talk about God a lot. Which God is the question? Because they have many gods ruling over many worlds. This is what Brigham Young says. How many gods are there? I do not know. But there never was a time when there were not gods and worlds, and when men were not passing through the same ordeals that we are now passing through. That course has been from all eternity, and it is and will be to all eternity. Every earth has its redeemer, and every earth has its tempter, and every earth and the people thereof, in their turn and time, receive all that we receive and pass through all the ordeals that we are passing through. Blech. Many gods, many redeemers. There's one redeemer, right? There are many gods, small gods. You see how I put small g-o-d? So for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into direct quotes for every single point, but I did want to include this one. So you can see, when, if you're talking to a Mormon, when they talk about God, you need to say, well, what do you mean by God? So this is what Mormons believe, according to Brigham Young. But what does the Bible say? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, right? One God and one mediator in the whole universe. So let's look into their God a little bit more and who this is. Because if you're thinking, the God that they talk about seems different than our Heavenly Father, you're right. Because their Heavenly Father is an exalted man who was once human and progressed enough to become the God of planet Earth. Again, it's not all just to make us smarter. This is so that when you're talking to a Mormon, you understand that when they talk about God, they're talking about an exalted man. That is qualitatively different than what we have, right? So these are the, uh, uh, this is the Book of Mormon translated from those golden tablets. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. And that men have got to learn how to be gods, the same as all gods have done before. Whew. Wow. Now does that sound familiar to you at all? How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's the same lie that he's been peddling since before the world was created, since the fall. So all of this means that Mormons, if they progress in righteousness enough, will attain God's status in the celestial heaven, which I'm going to talk about more in a minute. 
But what does God say about himself in the book that predates all of the Mormon sources, by the way? What does it say? Because God is an exalted man, according to Mormons. God says of, of himself, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. So while it seems like they refer to the same God that we do and trust him for salvation, their definition of the God they worship makes him infinitely different, infinitely inferior, I would add, than the God that we worship and trust. So, having seen who and what they think God is, where did we come from? Let's just look at some of the basics. Who is God? Why are, who are we? Where do we come from? Right? Where do we come from? Well, first of all, we've got to talk about the Heavenly Mother. Or I should say Heavenly Mother. They don't say the Heavenly Mother. They say Heavenly Mother because then it makes it sound like they're talking to their mom. Heavenly Mother is the original wife of Elohim. So why do I have to talk about that? Because they are having celestial children, spirit children, the same way that babies are conceived here. Which is blasphemous, by the way. And our God doesn't need a wife to conceive children, right? He conceived the Lord Jesus miraculously through the Holy Spirit. So, all people are spirit children conceived by Heavenly Father and Mother, small f, small m. Looks something like this. In their pre-mortal existence, uh, we all exist. And we are given bodies here on this earth, but we don't remember that because there is a, a veil of forgetfulness. And when we pass through it, then we don't remember the previous life. And then we live our life on earth, we die, and we go to the grave, and our spirit goes to paradise. Eventually we're going to be resurrected and then go into one of three terrestrial uh, heavens. Or, I'm sorry, um, the three uh, heavens, the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdom. Or for some outer darkness. Okay? So that's the plan. So they have many gods ruling over many worlds. Their God is an exalted man who is married to a heavenly mother. Together they conceive spirit children who eventually come to earth. So then who and what is Jesus Christ? Because this is really important. When they talk about, I mean, after all, they're the church of Jesus Christ, right? Of Latter-day Saints. That sounds good. Who was Jesus Christ? They teach and believe that Jesus was the firstborn spirit child, and Lucifer was the second. So again, blasphemous, but this also gives Satan an equal, evil, or uh, evil, yes, equal standing with Jesus Christ. Now, just a little background knowledge here, I think, or info, I think we've got time. In eternity past, I guess it wasn't eternity, but a long time ago, because before God there was another God before that, and before that another God, and so on and so on. But the Heavenly Father got the gods together, and they voted on whose plan they would go with. Would it be Jesus' plan where he would come to earth, live a a, a godly, uh, moral life, and then get as an example of how we could live, an example of sacrifice and stuff? Or would they go with Lucifer's plan, which was to force them to cooperate? Well, they went with Jesus' plan, and Satan was so angry about that that there was a war in heaven. The angels, or the spirit children, that, uh, that didn't take a side, they stayed in the middle to see who was going to win, whether it would be the, 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 the good spirit children or Lucifer's spirit children. The ones that just kind of vacillated and waited Uh, Afterwards, the Heavenly Father was so angry about that that he decided to punish them by sending them to earth with the mark of Cain, which is dark skin. Now, they've had to backtrack on that quite a bit over the last 50 years or so, but it is still in their writings. That's just a little bonus nugget. So, we see 
that their Jesus is really no different than us, except for that he's in an exalted state now. But who does the Bible teach that Jesus is? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that's the apostles, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So who is the Lord Jesus? He is Lord. He is creator, and he is the eternal God. Remember, nothing was made that was made without him. And we also see in Colossians 1, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in all things, in him all things consist. Okay, that is who Jesus Christ is. He is not an exalted man. He is our savior. He is the creator he is before all things and in all things, and in him all things consist. But what do they think of the work of Jesus then? Well, Mormons teach that Jesus' atonement, sounds good, was accomplished when he prayed in Gethsemane and sweated great drops of blood. And that is a down payment on something that the Mormons obtain later again, through holy living, etc., etc. What do we see? What does the Bible teach? Was it when he sweated great drops of blood? No, it's when he gave his life for us. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Friends, why did he sit down? He sat down because he got the job done. You don't need the Book of Mormon. You don't need the Pearl of Great Price. You don't need doctrines and covenants. What you need is the Son of God who died for your sins, loved you so much that he was willing to do that, and offers you salvation free of charge, though he paid a great price. He got the job done. It is finished. So according to the LDS Church, how does one benefit from the work that Jesus did? This atonement. How do they get in on this? Well, salvation comes through faith in Christ plus. I don't even need to tell you what the plus is. If it's plus anything, it's wrong. Who gets the glory when it's plus? It's not Jesus Christ alone, right? Membership in the true Christian church, Mormonism, obedience of LDS doc ordinances, and holy living. And I have a few on the next slide. Salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. LDS people listening to this, if you are, why? Why would you believe in Jesus Christ if he's not who the Bible says he is? I mean, if you don't have Jesus Christ as the only, as the third member of the Trinity, second member of the Trinity, and as the holy God who came to die for your sins, then why would you need to trust in him? So these ordinances include belief in Jesus Christ. Again, which Jesus Christ are we talking about? Being baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost through the laying on of hands by a person with priesthood authority. You need to endure the tests of their life on earth, follow the teachings of Christ and his apostles, keep God's commandments, repent of, their, of your sins, undo any wrongs that you commit, treat other people in the way that you'd want to be treated, to reach the highest level of glory, a person must, person must also have been sealed in eternal marriage in a Mormon temple. You guys are all out of luck. So, oh, and a, a special bonus for you ladies. If you happen to somehow accomplish all this and you die, all you need is for your husband to come and call you into the celestial heaven. But he does need to, so mind your P's and Q's and don't burn the uh, lasagna. 
I haven't even mentioned anything about the holy undergarments that they wear, but they're sanctified. They're supposed to be pure and remind them about what Mormonism is all the time. Once uh, they go through some secret um, uh, practices in the temple, they become, they are entered into the priesthood, and then they wear uh, this, these holy, this holy underwear. I'm wearing some now, actually. No, I'm not. I'm not. Well, you never know if I am, so... Maybe I am, maybe I am not. So, how do we benefit? How do people benefit from the Lord Jesus Christ's work? This is what Mormonism says. What does the Bible say? Paul says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Isn't that wonderful news? that we don't have to worry about keeping our end of the bargain, that we don't have to worry about failing the law. In fact, we know that when we are focused on not failing the law, that's when we fail the law, right? So we are justified or declared righteous when we simply put our faith in Jesus Christ apart from anything that we do. And now who gets the glory? It's not you, it's not me, it's Jesus Christ. But not only is the means of salvation twisted and man-centered, everything's man-centered in this. Mormonism's concept of heaven is very different than what the Bible teaches. Heaven is one of three kingdoms. The celestial highest. Oh, you don't even have to write anything down. Saved you some time here. The terrestrial and the telestial. That's the lowest. Where non-Mormons and kind of the -the run-of-the-mill evil people will go there will go to the celestial heaven. So in Mormonism, everybody ends up in one of the heavens, which removes the reality of hell and gives false hope to the lost of going to one of these heavens. Well, I'll still get in on the celestial one, right? The Bible teaches that we're all sinners in need of salvation, that God in his love sent Jesus Christ to pay our sin debt penalty. So he was separated from God so that we don't need to be if we would simply trust in his son as our savior. Our redemption was very costly, but it's free to us. But the choice is heaven or hell, right? So Mormonism removes the reality of hell and perverts the hope of heaven. But as further evidence that Mormonism is nothing more than a works-based religion, guess who goes to outer darkness? Satan, his demons, and apostate Mormons. The only way you go to hell is if you're Satan, a demon, or an apostate Mormon. And again, I think what I read is that this is because uh, free will and volition is really important to them. Uh, Because, you know, remember, Jesus uh, came and set an example so that we would choose to follow him. Which again, sounds good, but it's just a a uh, man-based, human effort, uh, works-based religion. So, for someone who's once learned the gospel of Mormonism, then they turn away, that person, for that person is reserved the harshest punishment. Well, they certainly define foundational terms and concepts differently. Uh, So it probably won't surprise you to learn that they use the term grace to mean something very different than us. They'll say that you're saved by grace. But this is what Nephi wrote in the Book of Mormon. We tremble at the very thought of dying and being captives of the devil. Nephi taught us clearly what we ought to do. He said, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. What does the Bible say? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of word, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know what I say to all this? I say, thank you, Lord, for making your plan of salvation so simple yet powerful. And the purity and clarity of God's word and how well we've been taught. Amen? Oh, man. Because people gobble this up. And I guess it provides some sort of hope for them, even though I don't know how you can persist for very long and think that you're going to have a chance. So when you encounter LDS people, remember, 
they have different meanings for the things they might seem at face value to, uh, to be close to what we believe. So they, they get a few things wrong. Who God is, what God is like, who Jesus is, who Satan is, how mankind was created, how Christ atoned for our sins, how one can be saved, what heaven is, what hell is, and what grace means. Just a few things wrong, which leaves us all with a great big frowny face. <laughs> Took me a while to do that. <laughs> I had to leave it in. Uh, so what do we do with this information? Well, first of all, let's not be deceived into thinking that we're on common ground with the LDS doctrine, right? You might forget a lot of these things, but hopefully you'll remember, whoa, I was really convinced at least at that point. Write a few of things down. What are the most important things? Who God is, who Jesus Christ is, what he's done, right? But the goal is really to reach them with the gospel. Yes, have your defenses up, but have your, the heart to reach them with the gospel. Let's, so let's be aware of a few things when delivering the good news. First is, many Mormons don't even know the foundations and the core tenets of their religion. I mean, let's be fair. Many of them don't know. I mean, if they heard all this stuff, and maybe you're listening to it and you're embarrassed or thinking, yikes, is that really what it's all about? Well, look into it. That's, that's your foundation. So do we need to rub their nose in this, really? You know, they probably just crave meaning or they want to belong to something. And it is a very special uh, uh, elite or, you know, um, a set-apart religion. They like to feel special and like they're on an elite team. They have admirable families, don't they? And they're, maybe they're impressed by the Mormon lives or their morality. Because man looks at the outward things, doesn't he? So what can cut through all of this? Well, it may be necessary to reveal some of their teachings, uh, some of their foundations, which is why I tried to give you so much of that tonight, even though it's, I know it's not very encouraging. But we need to be wise about that. And, um, and yet, hopefully, again, you are impressed by the contrast of the purity of the gospel and the clarity of God's word. So that's why I wanted to give you so. So if you have to challenge them on some things, uh, just to at least get them to listen and to consider, um, this may be of use. But what they really need to be impressed by is in God's word is his son, is Jesus Christ and his finished work. You know, I read a, a couple accounts and I listened to a couple accounts or testimonies of people who got saved. And you know what made the difference? is that they, they had a hope so salvation that they were always afraid because they know deep down that they're never going to measure up. Does that sound familiar? Just like every other religious person you run into, right? Because they're not saved by grace. They're saved through works and through their religion and through X, Y, and Z. So let's point them to who Jesus Christ is and his finished work. Who Jesus Christ is and his finished work for them on the cross. And let the Holy Spirit do the drilling down there. Because it really boils down to a works-based hope-so religion. So let's talk about the finished work of Christ. How undeserving we all are, and yet how blessed we can be. Let's also use God's word and the gospel. Because that's the only message God promises to bless. Now, it may be helpful to define some terms so they don't think that we mean the same things that they do. That might be necessary. But then let's go right back to the gospel because really, again, that's the message that God's going to use. And next, let's realize that Mormons are blinded by a works-based religion. At the end of the day, they're trusting in their works. If they want to quote all of the other books, the Pearl of Great Price and stuff, let them. But go back to the Bible. Give them verses about the fact that we're not saved by our works, that the work is done and that they're saved by grace through faith. Because that's what they need to be impressed by, the majesty and the glory of God. His holiness, but also his love and grace, um, all of which is contained in the gospel of grace, right? So 
I hope you walk away impressed by those very things tonight. And after having looked into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, comparing it with God's Word, which tell us who He is and what He's done, you know, we have such a pure and wonderful message to share. And they need it. We have a God with a character of sovereignty. He's not an exalted man in heaven. He's always been and always will be. He answers to no one. He's sovereign. He's holy, but he's also loving and gracious. We have a God who is truth and who wants to save anyone who will stop trusting in themselves and the false religions of man and instead trust the Lord Jesus' finished work on the cross. All glory and praise to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the clarity of your word. And we do bow the knee in your presence because you are the only God and you are sovereign creator. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to this earth and dying for us. Though you didn't have to, though you were in eternity with the Father, you chose to because you love us. And you couldn't bear to see us have no hope with a certain destiny of hell. So thank you that you died for us so that we could know for sure that we have eternal life because you've promised it and you stand behind your promises. Thank you that you stand behind your, your very word as well and that it, you've made it so clear, abundantly clear, who you are. Just pray that if any uh, Mormons are listening or after the fact or tonight, uh, that they would see that Jesus Christ is enough. They would see who you are. They would go to the Bible and let it speak for you. Let your words speak to them, I should say. And so we thank you for these things and for this time. And thank you so much for your son in his name.